her. Uh, Evelyn asked me why, why her and why this type of uh, uh, program today. And I said, because she is in an encyclopedia about history and Johnson County and and things were and the way things are now. Uh, so I think what to what we need to do is to go back to the beginning, Evelyn, and talk about growing up in Shady Valley and some of the adventures and, and some of the things that happened to you as you were growing up in Shady Valley. Okay. Well, I was an ugly little toehead of a girl. And I can remember when I went to my cousins uh, every summer in Bristol, they had a four poster bed with a canopy. And I would get in that bed and think I was Scarlett O'Hara because Gone with the Wind had just come out. And if I could only have seen myself because I had bangs and straight hair and as ugly as a mud fence as a little girl. <laughs> but I thought I was Scarlett O'Hara. So uh, I grew up, I grew up as an only child in family and had cousins on both sides. So I never felt lonely. Cousins over the hill and one cousin down the road. So uh, I, was, I was a well protected child and, and loved growing up in Shady Valley. Oh, living on a farm. Now, that's always lots of fun. There's a, oh. all kinds of things you can get into. We were talking just a few minutes ago about thrashing. You know, yeah. A lot of people don't know what thrashing is. Most people don't. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The thrashers would come to our house and mama would put on the white tablecloth and cook uh, tons and tons of food. And, and Mr. McCoy, I think was his name from Damascus would get a bath and put on clean clothes for dinner. And, and we thought that royalty had come because he was the head of the threshers. It was a wonderful time. Oh, yeah. Oh, those machines were great big machines. And all the wheat in from the field and um, they would run it through the machine and it would uh, break the wheat from the chaff. We'll go back biblically on that if we want to. <laughs> right. And, and would take the grain and put it out in the in the granary. And it was fun to play in that, wasn't it? Oh, yes, yes. I would go upstairs and get that stuff and swim mm -hmm. um, because it would, you know, it would just go this way and that. And it was wonderful. But I remember being on the wagon with a great load of that stuff going down to the mill. And I had had honey and hot biscuits and honey for breakfast. And I got sick as a dog going down the road, bumpity, bumpity, bump. And that was when I discovered I had a horrible, horrible allergy to honey. Really? Yeah. Oh, so, goodness. And honey, and honey is one of the things that, that they always sweetened everything with honey back then, too. I know. And it's supposed to be good for you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't good for me. <laughs> but, you know, if we, if we think about Shady Valley... Uh, we were just talking, you know, Shady's kind of like, uh, kind of has three grand divisions. You have upper and middle and lower. Yeah. And you lived in the lower part of Shady. Yes. And going to the middle part was like going to a, a different town or something. <laughs> and going to the upper part, upper part, that was just unheard of. That would be three times a year or something like that. Right. <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful growing up. You know, there, there was... Uh, in that time period, every little community had a little school. Mm -hmm. And I think Shady Valley had, uh, let's see, I've got those written down, the two-room schools. There was one in Crandall, yeah. one in Harmon, one in Shady Flats, and one in Winchester. You've got that. Mm -hmm. You've yeah. got that four, and I went to the one in Crandall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two-room school. Yeah. Now, what was that like? Uh well, uh, it was wonderful. It was wonderful because uh, we had uh, and had him bring hot soup for us every day. And uh, so we we had the hot soup and we had a great old big pot bellied stove in the middle of the room that uh, if you got if if your seat was too close, then you fell asleep. And if you were over in the corner, you froze to death. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was neither here or there. That was in the middle of the winter. 
and we walked to school. I mean, it didn't matter whether it was snowing or what it was. Sometimes I can remember I would start out to school. Now, this was all before I got in the fourth grade because the, the uh, rock school was finished. And uh, and I, I had my fourth grade on in the rock school, but I was just a little tot uh, and had to walk. As my daughter used to say when I'd be telling these wild stories, I know, Mom, and you walked a mile to school, which I did. I feel both ways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, through the snow and uh, somebody got uh, my... <laughs> My friends from Bristol gave me a snowsuit, which was the first snowsuit in Shady Valley. So I wore my snowsuit, but it was uh, it was wool. Oh goodness! Yeah, it was <laughs> wool. And so I would uh, I would get on the on the uh, little hill and roll down the hill on my way to school. And when I got to school, I would be wet all over. And uh, Noah Blevins was the teacher, and he would say, "Evelyn, when are you going to get settled down?" <laughs> and I and one day I said, when I get my wet pants off <laughs> and the big room, which had fifth and no, had sixth and eighth grade students who were quite sophisticated. They yeah. thought when I said that they all just went into hysterics. Yeah. When I when I get my wet pants off. So I, I, I they never let me forget that. Well, but anyway, you know, we didn't have buses back then. So you did have to walk to school. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, there wasn't a lunch room, and you took took your lunch, uh, or like you said that there, you had an aunt or someone that brought the soup in. Yeah, sometimes you would. And yeah, winter mm -hmm. time. Uh, when I went to Bethel to the two room school, we were fortunate enough to have uh, a kitchen and tables where we we got to eat in a lunch room so, oh wow so we were in modern times you were <laughs> oh gosh i have uh, i have i have the minutes of one of the pta meetings and um uh, they asked everybody a chicken every every school child was assessed one chicken and they had to bring the chickens in and then they had an auction and they sold these money to get school books. So, uh, you know, there was no county uh, school board or anything like that at that time. Do you remember your first grade teacher? Uh, a little bit. Just a little bit. I can't remember what her name was, but I can see her because um, I had uh, flu, I guess, uh, no, I had all those diseases. That's what it was. Yeah, we got Pooping everything. Cough and all that stuff. And she came and spent um, a few nights with us. And I can't, she was from Mountain City, but I can't remember her name, but I just loved her. A lot of times uh, they would come and board with people. Yeah. Because yeah. You know, there might not be anybody. Play. And at that time, all you had to have was an eighth grade education. Yeah. To teach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My mother had a little bit past the eighth grade and she taught. Um, until I came along, and then in those days, I guess there was no such thing as babysitting and all of that, so she didn't teach anymore. Well, now the Rock School, uh, that was that was an interesting situation. Uh, they consolidated all those little schools that yeah. we were talking about that, and in 1938, they consolidated into the Rock School. Uh, and of course, it's still there now. And I understand your dad worked. Your father worked on that. He was the foreman mm -hmm. of building the school. Yes. Well, what was the WPA? A lot of people younger than us probably won't know what the WPA was. Works Progress Administration. Right. And it was one of the things that FDR uh, going in order to take care of all the poverty that had happened during the Great Depression. And whether people like him or not like him, and 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 there were as many people hated him as as liked him, but he did get some of those programs started. Yeah, that and made gave, a difference in a lot of lives. Gave people employment too, didn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh um, yeah. You know, Shounds School that was down here. That was the Rock School in Shounds. That was built by the WPA. Uh, a lot of people won't know it, but the high school, the gym, where the senior center is now was built by the WPA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, uh, a lot of a lot of rock buildings at that time 
where you can tell that they came at that time period. Yeah. But they used materials that were at hand. You know, instead yeah. of using brick, you used the rocks. And that old school over there is still as good as it was the day it was built. I'm surprised. Rock on the outside and then on the inside was uh what? Chestnut, wormy chestnut. Oh, which is a thing of the past now and yes. worth it's an arm and a leg. Yes. But um, it was, yeah. I'm so glad that they have have adopted that now and made it into a community center and yeah. even have a festival around the school and cranberries and stuff. Yeah, and shady I know. It's wonderful. Yeah. My daddy would come home every night and tell me, I would come home from my little two-room school and daddy would come home from working on the big school and he would tell me how exciting uh, it was going to be for me next year because I was going to be in a big school where there would be four or five classrooms, you know, and I just couldn't believe what he was saying. Just, oh, and he said there was going to be an auditorium and there was going to be a stage. Mm -hmm. Boy, that really got me because I can't remember when I was not a ham. <laughs> So I couldn't wait to get on this. I have a feeling you were into a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I, think, I think our grandmothers would have said mischievous. <laughs> <laughs> Some of that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I had I had a little excerpt here that I had found uh, in your book. And uh, I, I already warned you I was going to do this. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it seems that there was some sipping going on. Uh huh. Um, right. Uh, it's, uh, somebody, uh, Tardy, was uh, taking his brew and putting it in bottles. Uh huh. And you were there helping him. Uh huh. And you had a little teacup. Uh huh. And you wanted a little sip. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, that sip turned into more than one sip, didn't it? Well, <laughs> you want me to finish that story? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> now, Stephanie's watching her. <laughs> <laughs> she knows the story. Well, uh, Tardy was uh, was bottling his homebrew. And uh, when and I, I wanted to sip, which you said, and I got the sip, and I liked it. <laughs> so I would say, Tardy, can I have another sip? No, 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 no. This is not for children. And so I I watched. And he would have to do this, and then he would have to turn around and do the bottling with some kind of a bottling machine he had. And I figured out that I had just enough time to dip my little green cup into the <laughs> homebrew, which I did about every time that he turned around. Well, he left and because uh, his job was done. And so uh, I got up to leave. And uh, I found out that the floor was uneven all of a sudden. <laughs> when I would step, it would be up there. And then I'd step another time and it'd be down there. And I, and I had things to hold on to, so I held on to them until I got outside. And I held on to the, uh, to the building until I got around the corner. And then I was on my own out in the yard. And Mama found me stretched out in the yard. <laughs> And uh, the rest is uh, is a, not a nice story. She sent for the doctor, and he came, and he said, if I didn't know better, I think that child had had some alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and Mama said, she had alcohol. There's no alcohol. <laughs> and my daddy came and didn't take him long to know what had happened. And he said, get that stuff out of my cellar, and I don't want you to ever put any more in there again. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> so that was that was my tale of uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm sure in, uh, in in the Baptist household that was probably <laughs> being very risky. <laughs> it was terrible, absolutely terrible. But we had a, a bachelor uncle living with us, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, bachelor uncles had their ideas. Uh, yeah, they, they could get you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Yeah, but Daddy took care of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. When you finished, when you with the rock school at eighth grade, you were ready to come over over the mountain mm -hmm. to go to high school. Yes, and uh, 
I understand that there was a bus, because, but it was privately out. Yes, it was. Okay. And you twelve dollars a month, I think. That's not too bad. Mm -hmm. And you rode the you rode the bus for a while, but then you decided that that wasn't going to work. No, it was not going to work at all because uh, I wanted to be in activities, and uh, my mother and dad had not been one of the mothers and dads, good or bad. They hadn't been one who said, you've got to make straight A's. My mother wanted me to be a well-rounded person and, and all of that. And she, she suspected that if I got into activities, that would probably round me out. So they never insisted that I make a, a straight A's, mm -hmm. which I didn't in math or <laughs> geometry or physics. Yeah. I just made enough grade. I, well, Ray Shawn gave me enough grades till I could get in college. Okay. <laughs> I don't know that I deserved them. And geometry, oh my. You, you needed John Mass, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he could have done anything with my mind because it didn't go toward math. Not at all. But, but you boarded. Oh, yes. With, I boarded with your grandmother. Great grandmother. Great grandmother. Great grandmother. Yes. Mm -hmm. Grandma Wilson. Right. And Grandma Wilson was as tough as nails. She was a now, little mind bit, you, I loved her. She was little too. She was, she was little, yeah. but she was tough. Yes. I had a boyfriend, and he would bring me home, and we would sit on the porch in the swing. And Grandma, oh, she would call time on us, <laughs> and we knew better than to have her call time on us twice. Right. I did it once, <laughs> and that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> but she was lovely. I loved her. And that's where you met Marjorie. Oh, yeah. Marjorie, uh, Marjorie and Marjorie. Mm -hmm. They were best friends. And it's amazing. Uh, people, when I've told this story, people have marveled at it because three usually don't make it. You know, uh, what is it? Three's a crowd. Right, usually. Uh, but they took me in uh, to their little group. I mean, we became a little group. And and we the three of us became inseparable through high school. Yeah, well now Marjorie was my cousin too. So I know she so was. You, you were getting steeped in, in Wilson's really quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love Marjorie. Yeah. I saw her about a month, I think, before she died. Yeah. I loved her. And Marjorie Ann died much earlier than that. But five. the three of us had so much fun together. She had five boys. Five boys. Yeah, Marjorie and I took her out to lunch one day. And uh, our whole purpose was to tell her about the birds and bees. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably too late by then. It was too late, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, you've always liked uh, dramatics and, and stuff like that. Uh, yes. Was, did you get involved in something like that in high school? Oh, yes. I was in, uh, once I was in the first play, I was in every play after that because I loved it. I loved it. And that was one of the main reasons that I came to uh, board with your grandmother, your great grandmother, Right. Uh, was I couldn't be in plays. And there were four plays a year, if I remember. Each class did a play. Right. And then there was a play, uh, a school play mm -hmm. at, toward the end of the year. And uh, I, I tried to be in every play. Well, you know, they were they were still following that tradition when I got to high school. Were they? Each class had their own play, the yeah. freshman, freshman class, and then we had a commencement play at the end of commencement the Commencement play, that's what it was. Yes, yeah. At the end of the year. So same thing that and of course that fit in with that big old auditorium at the time. Doesn't look like it like it did then that right yeah. now, but uh you know, they had a stage and the big uh, oh, big yeah. stage in the study hall there, and that yeah. was a great place to put on plays at that yeah. time. Had some good plays too. I remember. Uh, one thing I found in when I was reading in your book uh, is some of the teachers that you had in high school. Uh, Myrtle Buchanan. She was <laughs> marvelous. Yes, she was. She was a man, and she wore she uh, she would help her husband in the dairy, uh -huh. and she came to school with. Some stuff on her shoes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and she wore those old school marm shoes. Probably the same shoes she had on when you were in school. 
And she wore her hair in a bun. Right. And wore those old uh, print, you know, printed dresses. Right. And uh, carried so many books. Because she had, she was the kind of teacher that wanted to teach us everything. She wanted to, we wanted, she wanted us to experience everything in the world. And so she'd bring loads of books. And as she opened the door and came in, there would be a book here and a book there and a book there on the floor. So Margie and Margie and I uh, would get up and it was our chore, we thought, to bring the books behind her. So we'd pick up the books behind her. We would bring it to her desk. And um, there was nothing in, I mean, there's nothing to the story that you hear when you're taking um, a school, when you're in college, they're telling you how to be a good teacher to always have a neat desk. Uh, -uh. Her desk was so full of stuff that we couldn't find any place to put the books. In. <laughs> but everything that she had on that desk would have something to do with something that she wanted to wanted us to learn or wanted us to experience mm -hmm. so I, I just said nonsense when the teachers um, that I had in college would say always have a clean desk I would say nonsense she was one of those people if you looked at her you would certainly underestimate how intelligent she was how yeah. smart she was you know who she looked like uh Eleanor Roosevelt exactly <laughs> <laughs> She was there when I got there. Yeah, she did. Well, she looked like Eleanor Roosevelt. Let's see. Then I've got Della Hawkins was there. She was wonderful. One of, one of the teachers. Ray Sham. Yeah. Um, he was wonderful for people who already knew math and all that stuff. Right. They loved him and he loved them because they'd talk about higher math and all that stuff and leave the rest of us just sitting behind. And he'd put a, something on the board when we had geometry. Now you all understand that. It was as clear as could be. I'd get home and I'd think, I don't know what. <laughs> I was not the math type. I, I wasn't either. I had a terrible, if it hadn't been for Aunt Ruth, uh, Bella, and I don't know how I would have gotten through Wasn't that. she wonderful? She was. Oh. Yeah, she certainly was. She was yeah. another cousin, too. <laughs> well, she was marvelous. Uh, let's say Mr. Everett, I think, was. Uh, he was a teacher, and then he was the principal. Yes. He, oh, you talk about a disciplinarian. Wow. He was. We had him for um, American history, and we just loved him. And when he came in, you know, Avadami had left, and 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 Paul ever came in, and we were ju we were seniors at that time. And he said, what are you doing about a yearbook? And we said, Mr. Mr. Donnelly said, we couldn't have a yearbook because the war was on and all that. He said, nonsense, you're going to have a yearbook. And we fell in love with him at that moment. <laughs> and our love affair lasted and still lasts in my memory. He was wonderful. I he loved was. Paul Everett. But now he was a disciplinarian. I he know. was that. Even those, even those great big old boys that came out of Shady Valley. They snapped to attention when oh. he came down the hall, I tell you. And listen, if uh, if he saw a couple down the hall with their arms around each other, everything, you know what happened? <laughs> we would have we would have immediately a call. All the girls would be in the auditorium and all the boys would go upstairs in uh, one of the rooms up there. And he would tell us what decorum should be all about. Right. <laughs> I, I can just I can just hear it. Uh, let's see, I have Hazel Shaw. Oh, I loved Hazel Shaw. I loved her. She was tough as nails. Oh, she was. I said, all the teachers back in that time, I mean, you know, they didn't fool around. They were very specific. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. no discipline problems at all. And Louise Jones. She was a sweet little teacher. And Paul McEwen. Paul. Paul McEwen, preacher. Oh, preacher McEwen. Yes. Oh, my goodness, yes. I remember preacher McEwen. Yeah, he coached, I think, too. But yeah, he did. Yeah, he and he taught civics or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was from down No Valley, down down my way. Yeah. So, um he was he was he was great. Uh a friend of, of my uncle, Nat. So, mm. you know, let's see. what well, I've got the lesson plan here. So, oh, Mrs. Butler. I didn't have her. She wasn't there when uh, when I got there, but Mrs. Butler had the Glee Club. Oh, what a wonderful thing she had there. She had uh, about uh, 15 or 20 boys. Mm -hmm. 
with wonderful voices and been all of us girls. And we did beautiful things. We sung everything from Wagner up and down the line. We sung, uh, uh, we sang uh, Blue Danube Waltz. She had words to the Blue Danube Waltz. Mm -hmm. And we sang that. Um, so she she uh, introduced me uh, to a lot of uh, of good music that I had never experienced before. Right. And I was always thankful for that. And and she had two sons that uh, taught uh, Jimmy taught Jimmy and John band band when I was in school. And John yeah. uh, was a good friend with you. Yeah. Mr. He was Stephanie's god father because he went overseas with us when we went to uh mm -hmm. to france he stayed a year right and catherine catherine yeah your sister right um I have to tell you a funny story about catherine real fast okay Go, um <laughs> catherine i noticed that catherine would come by through my yard every once in a while and i didn't pay much attention to it and one day uh hetty uh, uh eisenhower who worked for me said do you know what she's doing and I said, no, what? She was a terrible diabetic, a diabetic that would go into a coma. And uh, and uh, <laughs> what she would do would go to town and buy candy where she got to hold the money. I don't know, but she'd buy a bunch of candy. Then she'd come through our yard, get in my car and eat all that candy and then go home. <laughs> and uh, I never paid any attention to it. But Hetty was at the window a lot, you know, washing dishes or something. So she caught on to what? Catherine was doing and uh, and we uh, kind of snitched on her to John and may have saved her life in do so doing that. She used to be my canastas uh, partner when we would play cards. I couldn't play bridge. I couldn't keep up with it. So Catherine and I would be partners uh, when I would go over to the Dr. Glenn's house and with mm. the wolves, you know, yeah. she, she was a lot of fun. Yeah. She surely was. Uh, now, I can't leave high school with you yet, uh, of course, unless we do the raisin story. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> well, we were in high school during the war. As a matter of fact, uh, December the 7th happened uh, when we were uh, the first uh, semester that we were in high school. And when I say we, March and March and all that bunch. And, and so the war we went along with the war from the time we got into high school right on through. Right. And uh, everything was was uh, rationed. Mm -hmm. And uh, our poor teacher had a terrible time trying to teach home economics with everything rationed. And so she uh, she threatened us with anything and everything if we opened any of the food because it was hard for her to get it. I see that now. I know it. Right. But one day I opened the raisins and took one bite of the raisins and everybody else decided they'd take a bite too. And when she came in to get that precious thing of raisins that probably took her stamps and all that to get, it was over half gone. And she vowed that if she found out who had taken those raisins, they would go home, not for a weekend, they would go home for the year. And she said, I make I make that promise to you. And so uh, meanwhile, I had gotten in the sick room with cramps. Right. And so I wasn't in line. And so she lined everybody up. And she, did you take the did you open the raisins? No. And, and they were telling the truth. <laughs> did you open the raisins? No. Did you open the raisins? And she said, Do, does anybody know who opened the raisins? And they just kind of did this. Um, they didn't lie, but they just sort of did this. Because they knew Margin Marjan knew. Yeah. And so Margin Marjan came into the sick room where I was, and I got well in a hurry <laughs> because they said, uh, I don't know what's going to happen to you, but I think you'll probably be sent home. And I said, What do you mean? Well, she is after whoever opened those raisins, and she, she vows they'll go home. So um, we put our heads together. What am I going to do? So we decided the only thing I could do was to meet her downstairs to Mr. Donnelly, and I would get on my knees and I would confess. <laughs> With a lot of tears. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So I went down in the, and by the time I, I got through half my confession, I was just sniffing and snorting and all of that stuff. 
And I remember Mr. Donnelly got out his handkerchief, came over and gave it to me. And he said, now, Evelyn, if you will clear your eyes, go down and wash your face and come back and sit down and have a sensible conversation with me, we'll see if we can work something out. <laughs> so he <laughs> saved the day. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that there are a lot was, was a lot of emotion because it was a wartime. Yes. And, and I shouldn't I, have done it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about the raisins. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, just just knowing yes. that a lot of the a lot, yes. of, a lot of the guys that were in high school had gone off oh, and yes. joined uh gone to the to war. Yeah. Uh, my uncle Earl had gone to uh, uh into the army and he was in Patton's army uh in Europe. And, and everybody knows Coach Arnold. Uh, Coach Arnold joined the the Navy, and he was in the South Pacific. But they came back and they finished high school. Uh, you would have been gone when they got back. I think they got through high school in 1948 yeah. or something. But a lot but didn't come back. A lot of them didn't come back. Yeah. But I, I can imagine uh, how traumatic it was. Oh, know, it, it was knowing what was happening. It was. Yeah. Yeah. It was something we shouldn't have had to go through. I mean, young people, because uh, when uh, when it happened that night and, and it was on the radio, I think it was on a Sunday night. And and I said to Daddy, uh, what does this mean, war? Oh, what does this mean? I said, all of this stuff that they're talking about. He said, it means war. And I said, well, we know we're in war. And he said, I think we better take a drive. So we took a drive. And Daddy told me something about what he imagined it would be like because he had been in, war, you know, World War One was his era. Right. And uh, you know, we did, we were dumb heads. We didn't know anything about war. No. But we learned in a hurry. Yeah. Yeah. It. It, it was a it was a a, a tense time. Yeah. And, and, and I remember the first thing that hit us. Uh, personally, and that's when I say us, I'm talking about a class, March and March and all the rest of us. Uh, our favorite teacher, Della Hawkins, uh, announced to us that she was leaving. Oh. And she left to go into North Carolina somewhere to work, uh, to make a lot more money, you know, work some, some, some more effort thing. Right. And then it really hit us. And then the boys started leaving. Was, yeah, it was a sad time. Yeah, it was. All right, let's let's it, let, let's see, let's what our time looks like. Okay, we're doing pretty good. Are we? Okay, we're through high school now. Okay, nineteen what forty seven? Uh, forty five. Forty five. We graduated forty five. Nineteen forty five. Okay, where are you going to go? I went to Berea College. Right. Yeah. Tell me about Berea. I know. Uh, it's a different type of college, it's not like UT or. Uh, Berea College is a college that you can work your way through. And I went, I was due to go to Virginia Intermont, which is a girl's school, you know, it's not there anymore. Yeah. Uh, Mama had wanted me to go there. And if I'd gone there, I would have turned out to be a snob, probably. Probably. You know, yeah. and I'm so glad I didn't. But Bill Leake, who was the Glenn's nephew, and I had fallen in love. And Bill went to Berea. So I was determined that I would go to Berea. So Dr. Glenn had gone to Berea. So he said, all right, if you insist, I'll get you in Berea. So he got me in Berea and off I went to Berea College. And uh, and uh, Bill was there a year and uh, I guess just a year. I think uh, he went maybe a month or two in the sophomore year. And then he went off to, to the war. The war was over, but he went into the Army. And somewhere along the line, I met a sailor. Aha, uh -huh. there you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> and thereby hangs a tale. Yeah, there's the rest of the story. <laughs> That's the rest of the story. <laughs> That's the rest of the story. Yeah. But now you had to work. Now you told me some. Oh, of yeah. The, yeah, you told me some of the things that you did when. I had to stick my hands up to about there in dishwater and wash dishes. That was called institutional labor. And I guess they still have it. I and uh, and uh, it, the people, when they first come into Berea, they have to have a semester or two of institutional labor. And that's the lowest, dirtiest stuff that has to be done. 
And then if you get through that without caving in and going home, uh, then you can choose something that is to do with your major. And so after that, I went to work in the library until I married Cook. And then we moved off campus and I didn't have to work on campus at all. Right. Yeah, you did marry while you were still at Berea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we were. Uh, soft, it was the end of our sophomore year when we married. Mm -hmm. uh, that must have been a challenge, being being married and trying to go to school and and getting acquainted and. Uh, no, I don't think it was. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I never worried about making straight A's. Right. Um, and and I, you know, I did I did well. I studied hard, and I, and I did well in what I loved. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't love, I got through the best I could. But when I, you know, but then I could do a major, and I had what they called an area major. So I took every literature course, every English course of any kind mm -hmm. that they had there. I did what they called an area major, and I was in. I was in hog heaven. Now I think too that isn't that when you got acquainted with uh with the Thespians. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Blank. Uh, Dr. Blank had uh he was the one that started the Thespian Society and he was head of what we call the TAB, which was the theater group. And they had a little old uh, little old wooden building that used to be a tabernacle. And that's how it came to be called the tab. And that's where we had our plays and everything. And so uh, that's where I uh, got to know what thespians were. So, and that just carried you right on through when you came back to Johnson yes. County, too. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, after you graduated from Berea, you went to UT. I did. You got your, what, master's? Yeah. At UT. It's kind of funny because Cook had no idea what he was going to do with his life. He really didn't. He he had he'd gone to college, he'd finished college, but he didn't know what he was going to do. And so my daddy, he was kind of a restless sort of person, wanted you know get on with the job. So my daddy gave me a thousand dollars, and he said, "Evelyn, go down to UT and get some more education while Cook decides what he's going to do with his life." And it didn't take you long to do that either, did it? Uh, uh, when you know a year. Three, three, mm -hmm. to get to or two semesters, how it really is down there. Uh, let's see. After that, then, uh, I think you came back to uh, the high school here. Mm -hmm. I uh, here. I, I taught here six years, I think, mm -hmm. and loved it. And loved probably it. had some of those same teachers you had in school who are now your peers. Yeah. <laughs> and a funny story about that. Do I have time to tell a story? I don't know. Uh, let's see what. We, oh, we've. We've got at least 15, 20 minutes left. We, um, we had to do those horrible uh, books where you kept uh, uh, the attendance and everything that went that way and that way and everything <laughs> had to add up and I wasn't good in math and all that. But anyway, I was very <laughs> careful. And the end of the year, uh, everything didn't tally. We'd give all those books to uh, Ray Shao and he would collate them into one big thing and send it off wherever it had to go. Well, it wasn't working. And so everybody thought that Evelyn Cook had made the mistake because uh, Evelyn Cook made no bones about saying, I don't like math. <laughs> so they, he went through my book. He couldn't find a thing the matter with it. So then he went through Hazel Ward's, you know, and she said, um, why are you going through mine? I don't have any mistakes. And he he went through everybody, so he couldn't find them, and a mistake ended up in his. Uh oh. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> that, that was kind of egg on your face, wasn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, oh goodness. Uh, you, uh, I think, did you and Dottie Howard get into doing some productions and plays, oh yeah, plays and yeah, stuff at that time too, yeah. didn't she? Dottie and I were in charge of the thespians. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, of course, she added dance to all of that because she had uh, studied dance at UT. Mm -hmm. And so we did some marvelous productions. 
She was a great teacher. She was, oh, she was there marvelous when I got there. She's marvelous. Yeah, we had we had a lot of fun, and uh, you know you weren't supposed to dance, but <laughs> but we had folk dancing. Oh yeah, she got the, by with the, a lot of stuff. And, and the gym, uh -huh. we learned how to do the Virginia reel uh -huh. and a lot of stuff like that. So. And you did a lot of stuff you weren't supposed to do <laughs> under the guise of <laughs> folk dancing. I remember that. Yeah, Paul Everett couldn't stand the thoughts of dancing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But now we did have proms and a few things like that. We didn't have a prom till he left. There was never a prom under under oh, no, really? Paul Everett. <laughs> he left and Gavlak came in. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the proms started got up. back to yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think it, in this in this time period, had Ed started teaching then? Well, let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He well, he worked at Shounds, I think, didn't he? He started at Shounds as a principal of the little Shown School. And then he went to Mountain City Elementary. Elementary, uh -huh. And was there. Uh well, I I was teaching uh, meanwhile and I taught six years. So he must have been four years or something like that at the Mountain City Elementary. And then you took off yeah. to Europe. Or overseas. Right, went overseas. Mm -hmm. Now, how did that happen? How did what was the connection? Well, I had always, always wanted to go to England. That was the dream of my life. I thought if I don't get to England, I will die. And so, uh, somehow or other, oh, I know friends of uh, cousins of John Butler uh, worked overseas mm -hmm. in um, in what was the uh, the the schools. Uh, the schools that were built over there to take care of the youngsters from GIs and people, Americans Armed who forces. were overseas. Armed and there forces. were a, hundreds of, of Americans overseas mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got in touch with John's cousins. Can't remember their names. Uh, and they told us all about the program and how it worked and so forth. And so mm -hmm. we decided to see if we could get on. So we went here and there and everywhere. And the one that would take us was, I think it was the Army or the Air Force, one or the other. And we ended up in Chateau, France. In France. Mm -hmm. you, but you were teaching American. Yeah, American GIs, GIs and, 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 and civilians who were, you know what civilians were called overseas? Feather merchants. <laughs> <laughs> really? So we taught the feather merchants children and the, uh, the military children. But you didn't speak French, or did you? No, th these were American schools. But you, you went into town or shopping or anything uh, like that. I, I had had a year of French in high school because Della Hawkins left then. Right. Uh, and I had two years in, uh, in uh, college and still couldn't speak it. <laughs> uh, I knew the grammar and all that. But I couldn't speak it. And I couldn't speak it because later on I discovered that uh, after I tried to tell the cab driver in Paris where we wanted to go. And he pretended that he couldn't understand me. And uh, even French people told me later that uh, that was a farce because uh, the uh, the cab, the anybody in Paris thought that nobody else but Parisians could speak French. Right. And far be it from uh, from for them to give Americans credit for being able to speak or know anything about French. <laughs> so that did a job on me. And uh, I didn't. And and Cook had never had a never had a day of French in his life. But he had about six or eight words. And we were out to dinner one night in a little country village in France. And uh, uh, the lady said, oh, oh. Too bad, too bad. Monsieur speaks French and Madame does not. I could have killed him <laughs> because he'd take his three words. <laughs> he, he, he was he was a very charming man. <laughs> oh, uh, let's see. You went to, you did to France, uh, then to England. Yeah, that was lovely. Mm -hmm. To England and. Uh, then 
I thought the interesting part was when you went to Turkey. Oh, five years. You had gotten used to, you know, you grew up in the mountains with all the greenery. You go to France, you go to England, and then you end up in Turkey, and you look out the window, and what do you see? Brown and gold and orange and everything on the clay banks. Yeah. It was very, very depressing. Did you get used to it? I got used to it. We went, I don't know whether it's in that book or not, but we went to a, a party soon after I arrived there. And uh, and I, I went over and was looking out the window and the lady, the hostess came over and said, uh, that was the first time I ever heard of the term, uh, not homesickness, what is it? I uh, can't remember now. Anyway, uh, she said, you are suffering uh, from whatever that was, which was homesickness and all that. She said, you will get over it. She said, when you look at those mountains and you see the beautiful colors of those bare hills, then you will know that you are over your uh, homesickness or whatever. And that's what happened. Now, Stephanie was born during this time period too, wasn't she? She was born in Chateau. The one year that we had uh, the dorm, mm -hmm. she was born there, and uh, that was that was a rough time where people, where girls spent a lot of time getting their their room ready for their children, you know, the babies and all that stuff. I brought her back to the one room that we had in the dormitory, which had two couches that made beds, and those couches were our place in the daytime where all of the teachers came over to complain about the principal. Then the principal would come over to complain about the teachers. And then in between some time, the kids would come in for their problems. And then at night we would sleep there and we'd put Stephanie in her little pram and scoot her into the bathroom until the boys that were behind the bathroom started uh, taking their showers and, uh, and they'd wake her up. Then we'd have to roll her back into that one room and then when they all got in bed, we'd roll her back into the bathroom and, and kind of close the door a little bit uh, until she could sleep through the night. And that's how we made uh, the first year of Stephanie's life. But she didn't she have an exciting childhood, though, growing up in, in, yeah. over, over there and, and all the experiences that yeah. she had? Yeah. But there's one experience. Let's see. Let's look at this real quick. There's one experience in here when you talked about uh, that when you're in Turkey, you decided to go to uh, Israel or something. Oh, yeah. You got yeah, to stuck, the Holy Land. Uh -huh. Stuck on the mountain. Oh, mercy. <laughs> oh, that was a nightmare. I, I can still get cold chills when I think about that. We got stuck in a, like going to Damascus, mm -hmm. the lowest place that you can think of in Damascus with the stream running by with no pavement on that road. And nobody in miles around and mountains that they said were filled with wolves and uh, no cars coming or going. And uh, that was our first, the third month that we had been in Turkey. We couldn't speak the language. And there we were stuck in uh, mud and couldn't move the car. And what were we going to do? It turned out all right, but. That was one of the most frightening experiences I ever had. You, you were lucky that there's good neighbors everywhere and that somebody came along and helped you. Yeah. 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 A bunch of laborers came along in a truck and literally moved our car off a rock. Let's see. We've got we've got 10 till 3. <laughs> <laughs> we, Anything we, else you want to know? <laughs> we, we may have to, to fast forward. Uh, of course, you know, you came back uh, when your mother uh, yes. got sick. Yes. You came back mm -hmm. and have been here, of course, ever since. Yes. But, uh, ended up going back to the high school and teaching. Yes. Uh, and since you've retired, you've been so active and instrumental in Heritage Hall. I think you told me that that was a dream that yeah. you had. It was. Mm -hmm. uh, we both remember that old auditorium. Yeah. Uh, of course, by the time you got back, uh, it was piled full 
of yeah. just junk and uh, yeah. Uh, Awful. It was a storage yeah. place. It was such a yeah, and mess. bulbs hanging down, one little little light bulb, you know. Right. Yeah. So you you were inspired to to do, do something, do something with it. Yeah. And now we have Heritage Hall. Yeah. All it takes is is a pushy woman with an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Gene Hackney. Right. I've always thought of Gene Hackney, and and uh, if he's if he's uh, uh, listening to this, uh, he and I have been through this discussion many times as holding on tight to his money. And when Gene said, "If you decide to, if you decide to turn that building into a, a you know a theater, I will give you the first amount of money on that." And I said, "Gene, you've got it. If you can turn loose of money, I can make it happen." <laughs> so we had big laughs over that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, Mr. Elvich, I think, did a lot of the designing. Oh, he was it. He was it. Job. Yeah. And the prisoners from uh, uh, from the prison, they yeah. did, the, did the work. Yeah. yeah. It was a wonderful committee. We had uh, Judy McGuire on it and Joan Trathan and Romaine St. John and, and Howard Elvich. Mm -hmm. What a team. Good. What a team. Yeah, boy. And now we can sit in that auditorium and in, enjoy place and yeah and the the thespian spirit lives on doesn't it? it does yeah it does and then of course you know the art center so you know things have changed uh did you ever feel like maybe going to a little one room school or two room school and living out in the country did, was that ever a handicap or was uh, you know, people think, you know, well, how did you learn anything? And, and Johnson County lots of times has gotten uh, bad press on, oh, I know. on our education. I know. But that's not really the whole story, is it? No. I think if I had gone, uh, oh, I could have gone many places. It would have been wonderful. But Berea was good for me because Berea took mountain kids and Berea knew uh, the backgrounds of, of mountain kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, they knew what to do with us to mold us and to, uh, you know, and give us. Uh, they they taught us there. What we had that was so good. Our heritage that was so fine. Right. I never thought about my Appalachian heritage as being worth two cents till I went to Berea. Mm -hmm. And so they they built. They built all that up with us. It was wonderful. Right. So I owe a lot of what I am to Berea College for what I'm doing. And all those wonderful teachers, too. Oh, yeah. We had. They gave me the background. That we had. Oh, yes. Lord of mercy, yeah. yes. Della Hawkins and, and Mrs. Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. You can't, you can't think about Myrtle and not Ben. <laughs> uh, it, it's been great. Being with you today. Well, I've loved it. Talking to you, we're, we're going to have to keep this this conversation going. <laughs> I have loved it. Thank you so much for well, including me in this. For... Whatever this is, you all are doing. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're tr we're trying to keep people aware of the rich heritage and the rich history that we have in Johnson County. And the people who have made that history. I think and that's you're, wonderful. You're part of that making of that history. I think that is wonderful. Right. And this young lady over here deserves a, a big applause for what she does. Yes. She and I think her husband probably <laughs> deserves uh, the patience <laughs> that he has. <laughs> well, you know, behind there... They said that behind every great man, there's a great woman. Right. That, that works in reverse. It I works think. in reverse. It surely <laughs> does. Yeah. Uh, Sheila, do we have any questions and anybody? Uh, well, Jeffrey Carrier oh. is watching from Ohio. Hi, Jeffrey. You can hear me, I know. Uh, he said, thank you for allowing us to listen to a fascinating and enlightening conversation. It has been a great thrill to see two of my most favorite people at one time. I dearly love you both. Incidentally, I wonder if Mrs. Cook's first grade teacher in Shady Valley might have been Lizzie Mink Eastridge. 
she told me once that Evelyn McQueen Cook had been one of her students. Yes. Yes. Hello, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> And Kimberly Reese is uh, on Zoom, and she, he, she says, Mrs. Cook is a treasure. Oh, my. <laughs> you, were, you were assistant principal when she was in high school, and I know she got in trouble. She, <laughs> she was like, she didn't eat raisins, but I'm sure she <laughs> She probably did something she, just too oh, naughty. Yeah, she was always in something. <laughs> I think that was uh, why I was a little bit lenient on those kids because I had been pretty naughty myself. <laughs> she said, I'm a fifth generation Wilson woman. So, <laughs> <laughs> And I think one of the questions, Pat, was what does Mrs. Cook consider her greatest accomplishment? Right. I, I think I stumped you on that one when I asked you. I have no idea. Honestly. <laughs> Just being there, probably. I have no idea. Uh, I would put Heritage Hall and the Art Center mm -hmm. as uh, as top things that I had anything to do with because they have meant so much to this community mm -hmm. and will continue to mean a lot to the community for ages to come. Right. And so many kids have been able to get on that stage I had a mother stand in the back of Heritage Hall one day and say to me, I'm so glad to have that uh, auditorium because my son, I've had him in every sport. He's not any good in sports. He doesn't want anything to do with sports. And now he has somewhere to express himself. And she said, it has been the making of him. And I am so thankful. And I think that's probably true of a lot of kids. True. So uh, I feel very, very happy that we pursued those two places. Good. Yeah. yeah. Jenny says hello from Washington State. Who? Jenny Johnson is watching you from oh my. Uh, Washington State. Well. Uh, Lisa Larmy Marjorie. Oh, yeah. Says hello. Well. And David Rash says, thank you, Mrs. Cook, best principal Johnson County High School ever. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so Hello you, to all of you. <laughs> you had a lot of fans watching you today. Oh, my. Yeah. Well, I loved my students, uh, both when I taught and when I was uh, assistant principal. Uh, I loved them. I love, I love young people. One thing I did forget to mention is that when you were teaching in, uh, I guess it was uh, Turkey, uh, the lady that wrote A Beautiful Mind yes. was one of your students. Yes, Sylvia Nasser. Mm -hmm. A great, a great girl. Wonderful girl. Yeah. It's always a small world, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. She was so smart that I would send her to the library with a with some kind of a project to do when uh, we were having uh, English, when, when, when we were having English four, uh, then I did uh, another English for uh, 15 bright students and she was in that and we did uh, all kinds of advanced literature and so forth. She was a Perfect. wonderful student and a wonderful girl. It's a wonderful movie too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I guess we're finished and thank you again. Oh, I've loved it. All right. Yeah, I was dreading it, but I've loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Trail says, thank you from the Johnson County Theater. With that, we will stop our stream on Facebook Live. Okay.